Over 3,000 fake vaccination cards from China seized at the U.S. border. They're even fitted with a counterfeit CDC logo. Extensive waiting lines form at an airport in Shanghai. Chinese students there are waiting to board U.S.-bound flights, despite skyrocketing ticket prices. China brings 300 study abroad programs to an end for college students. One-tenth of the shutdowns involve American universities. Beijing ups its harsh rhetoric surrounding America's withdrawal from Afghanistan, while a China affairs analyst points out a major U.S. problem tied to China. And Beijing holds military drills near Taiwan. Eleven Chinese aircraft entered the island's air defense zone, including two nuclear-capable bombers. Hello and welcome to China in Focus. I'm Evelyn Lee. U.S. federal agents in Tennessee say they seized thousands of fake CCP virus vaccination cards this year. According to a Friday statement from Customs and Border Protection, Memphis has confiscated over 3,000 of the falsified cards. All of them came from China. The fake cards have blank areas to fill in the recipient's name, birth date, as well as which vaccine was received. They're even fitted with a counterfeit CDC logo. Reports of the fraudulent documents surged after New York City announced that it would mandate vaccine passports to enter certain businesses. On top of that, hundreds of colleges and universities across the U.S. are requiring vaccination for students to attend in-person classes. The policies have sparked an active black market. On social media, the vaccination cards are sold for up to $200 each. While the vaccine is easily available across the U.S., some people say they'd rather not get the shot. That's due to a variety of religious or philosophical reasons, as well as safety concerns. Others say they doubt the efficacy of the vaccines since some confirmed virus cases have appeared in those who'd already gotten vaccinated. Many Chinese students are rushing to the U.S. At an airport in Shanghai, a line thousands of feet long could be seen forming all of them waiting to board an international flight. NTD Zon Ma has more. A recent online video captures Chinese students lining up en masse at a Shanghai airport, and many of them are going to the U.S. The huge demand on top of a shortage of U.S.-bound flights from China, ticket prices have soared more than 400 percent. According to Chinese media Yitzhai News, mid-August is the peak season for Chinese students heading overseas. It comes just ahead of the fall term, the start of the new school year. The report says that in July, U.S.-bound plane tickets ranged from $770 to $2,400. Just a month later, those ticket prices skyrocketed to the $3,000 to $15,000 range. There's an economy class seed for August 25th. The ticket fare is 21,360 yuan. The business class seed is 76,862 yuan. August 25th is peak season for international students to return to school. These prices are the lowest right now. Their higher press tickets are more than 90,000 yuan. Yitzhai News also reports there are fewer than 20 direct flights traveling from China and the U.S. right now. There are not many international flights right now, not many per day. For example, today there were only two. There's one New York-bound flight today. A Beijing political affairs commentator tells NTD that there could be a number of reasons behind the demand. The tide of people rushing to the United States is because the U.S. is still the preferred place to go for people around the world. Another reason is because the situation within China is tense. There are crackdowns happening on the elite. So these people are on edge and hastily rush to the U.S. They don't hesitate to buy a 100,000 yuan ticket. Hua notes that many are going overseas in search of a better future. Don Ma, NTD News. Beijing is spelling it out. It doesn't want citizens to leave the country. After Beijing stopped issuing 98 percent of its passports, it's now terminating hundreds of foreign college students' transfer programs. Chinese state-run media announced that China is putting an end to nearly 300 of these programs. These programs allow mainland Chinese students to study at an overseas college and obtain a diploma there. From the list of terminated transfer programs, about 30 are with universities from the U.S. For example, a master's degree program between the Georgia Institute of Technology and Shanghai Jiao Tong University. New York University is also on the list. The move is a possible sign that China wants to tighten its control of information that citizens are exposed to. 
Within China's borders, information is centralized by the regime, but overseas it's not. A U.S.-based China affairs commentator told the Epoch Times that Beijing's goal is to stop foreign education material and ideologies from entering China. And that includes students going overseas to study those ideas. Beijing's move comes after parts of China banned all foreign teaching material for primary and middle school students and mandated that their students learn Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics. And now the Xi Jinping thought course will apply to all students from grade school through college starting in September. According to the Ministry of Education, the course is aiming to gradually shape student support for the party's leadership and the socialist system. Xi Jinping thought was written into the Chinese Communist Party charter in 2017. And 18 research centers have been set up so far to study the ideology. It's a tradition of CCP leaders to summarize their words and thoughts into a theory and have everyone in the country learn it. This started with Mao Zedong, the CCP's first leader after the party took over mainland China. Mao's responsible for tens of millions of deaths resulting from his political clampdown and policies that caused massive famine. China upped its harsh rhetoric of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan since the Taliban declared victory there on Monday. A China analyst looks at the regime's response to the Afghan takeover. For years, the U.S. has been trying to get out of Afghanistan and its longest ever war. U.S. President Biden then announced that the last American troops would leave the country by the end of this month. But as that deadline drew near, the Taliban began taking over cities across Afghanistan. On Sunday, Taliban fighters reached the capital city of Kabul, while U.S. troops were just two weeks before their final withdrawal. China affairs analyst Tang Yingyuan points out a major problem for the U.S. What's the biggest disadvantage to the U.S.? That is, the Chinese Communist Party made a big deal out of it. Since the Taliban's takeover, Chinese officials and media outlets have started criticizing the U.S. They say the U.S. failed in Afghanistan from democracy efforts to humanitarianism. On Tuesday, China's foreign ministry spokesperson said America's mission in Afghanistan was a destructive one. The U.S.'s power and role is destroying peace and stability in other countries, not building it. Tang describes Afghanistan as a swamp of war, something the U.S. has been immersed in for two decades. Tang also adds the U.S. should withdraw from the region and concentrate on dealing with greater threats like Beijing's aggression in the Indo-Pacific region. In recent years, the U.S. has shifted from the focus of its anti-terrorism efforts. Its top national security priority is now competing with state adversaries, and China is one of them. President Biden rejected blame for what's happening and defended his decision to pull U.S. troops out. As the event unfolds, China appears to be highlighting the situation, especially its criticism of the U.S. But is China really happy about the outcome in Kabul? Tang says maybe not. Last month, at least nine Chinese nationals were killed in Pakistan in an explosion. Beijing quickly described the blast as an act of terrorism and expressed fears of regional instability amid the American military's withdrawal from the region. According to Chinese media, the Taliban has been providing armed support to what Beijing calls separatists in China's northwestern Xinjiang region. Uyghur Muslim ethnic minorities make up a large part of the area's population. Groups Beijing is known to suppress. Beijing is a little bit worried that after the Taliban took over, then some of the radical extremist and separatist forces in Xinjiang might have more room to grow and their power might expand. That may result in a spillover effect on the China-Afghanistan border. But Tang says Beijing has another big problem involving its Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative. Over the past two decades, the project has built an economic corridor through Central Asia, including Afghanistan. That corridor is an infrastructure network designed to enforce Beijing's influence outside China. Stability brought by the U.S. troops in the region had helped the Chinese regime to achieve that goal. But now it's a thing of the past. To use a popular analogy, the U.S. works as an administrator here. And then the Communist Party comes to set up stalls to make money, but doesn't pay the management fees. No matter what, the Communist Party can no longer act as leisurely as before when it enjoyed this kind of free security bonus.
But Beijing has shown no willingness to fill the power vacuum in Afghanistan after the U.S. departure. According to Chinese media, Chinese authorities say they won't get directly involved in Afghanistan's internal affairs. That means that the CCP doesn't have confidence in the set of values it advocates for, or its ruling model. It dares not push them into Afghanistan. Last month, China's foreign ministry published a series of photos. One shows China's foreign minister Wang Yi standing shoulder to shoulder with visiting Taliban officials. The Taliban has also repeatedly expressed hope to develop good relations with China. But are China and the Taliban really ready for friendly relations? The CCP and the Taliban, they are more so in a mutual exploitation to use each other. We don't see any real possibility of a strategic alliance or strategic mutual assistance between them right now. Though Tang adds Beijing may give the Taliban economic assistance as bait to use it against the U.S. I think China may have this intention, but whether it can actually achieve it, I think that's the question because the Taliban themselves are not idiots. According to a Tuesday report from the BBC, a Taliban spokesman said, Afghanistan will not be used against anybody. Following the Taliban's takeover, Tang says the core issue of what happens next is the current uncertainty. The question is now, how will the Taliban find a balance amid the power struggle between China and the U.S.? Chinese state-run media faced a new wave of backlash Monday after launching and later deleting a video. The clip appeared to be an attempt to beautify and praise the Taliban. One of the Chinese Communist Party's media mouthpieces, People's Daily, posted the video. It showed up on Chinese social media Weibo under the title, What Organization is the Taliban? The video claimed the word Taliban means students in Persian, and that members of the organization were mainly students from refugee camps. It also attributed the Taliban's dramatic expansion in recent days to support from the poor in Afghanistan. It went on to say that after the 9-11 incident, the Taliban regime was overthrown by the U.S. And because of that, a 20-year war began. A social media hashtag linked to the video soon made it onto the platform's trending topics list. But the publicity wasn't positive and mass criticism started flowing in. Some netizens wrote that, Whitewashing the Taliban is a most inhuman act. Some questioned, is it a good organization if it cuts off people's heads? One netizen responded sarcastically, you're really great to endorse this anti-human regime. Still another wrote, I really don't understand who is depriving women of their rights as human beings. Who captured and beheaded people in the streets? Who is the most recognized terrorist organization in the world? Who blew up the Bamiyan Buddha statue? The video and accompanying article were taken down around three hours after being posted. China carried out military drills near Taiwan on Tuesday. Warships and fighter jets exercised off the southwest zone of the island. Taiwan's defense ministry said 11 Chinese aircraft entered its air defense zone, including two nuclear-capable bombers. That is the same area where Taiwanese Air Force planned to exercise later at the same day. The Chinese regime claims the island as its own despite the fact that Taiwan is a de facto independent country with its own military, democratically elected government and constitution. A senior Taiwanese official familiar with the matter told Reuters that Beijing has also been conducting frequent electronic reconnaissance and electronic interference operations. He added, Taiwan believes China is trying to gather electronic signals from U.S. and Japanese aircraft so that they can paralyze them in a war. Earlier this month, the U.S. approved an arms sale to Taiwan valued at about $750 million. Police in China are ramping up censorship relating to the CCP virus. A Chinese citizen was recently fined for warning people about virus cases nearby. Others were detained for denouncing China's vaccines. Entities Don Ma has more. In communist China, authorities are censoring and punishing those that talk in a negative light about the state's pandemic prevention efforts. A Chinese resident tells NTD he's received a warning from Chinese police for saying he doesn't want to get vaccinated. We distorted his voice to protect his identity. He spoke to NTD on the condition that only his surname be used. Some people came to my home. They threatened me about my not wanting to get the vaccine. 
I posted this incident online. It went viral. It was reposted overseas too. The local public security bureau came looking for me. They told me not to talk about this to anyone. Many departments came looking for me. They told me not to talk to anyone. In an effort to maintain the image of a stable pandemic situation, Chinese police are even punishing those that warn others about virus cases near them. For example, last Tuesday, a resident in a city in China's Hubei province posted online saying that some people in a local factory were infected with the virus. He was arrested the same day and detained for three more days. Another warned online that nearby there were people who had close contact with the virus patients. He was fined about $50. One Chinese resident tells NTD police handcuffed him to a metal chair and disciplined him for questioning China's current vaccine policies. The main reason is because I criticized and opposed their vaccine policies on Twitter. I said although there is no order from higher up for mandatory vaccinations, they did give the order of wanting an 83 percent vaccination rate among the population. They pushed the responsibility onto lower level authorities. I think they're targeting me was because of this tweet. It seems Beijing's tactics in handling the virus situation haven't changed much since the beginning of the pandemic. Their speech censorship is reminiscent of the way they treated Dr. Li Wenliang. He was one of the earliest Chinese doctors to warn people of the CCP virus. But he was reprimanded by authorities for so-called rumor mongering. Don Ma, NTD News. And the Chinese regime has taken over a troubled private oil refiner. Liaoning Bora Enterprise Group is undergoing a tax probe that could lead to hefty fines or even being shut down. NTD's Patrick Hayden has the story. A private oil refiner in China, the Liaoning Bora Enterprise Group, has been taken over by the Chinese regime. The, the biggest problem about what is happening in China is that it gives very very negative signals to investors. Its plant in the northeastern province could even be shut down amid a tax probe that is currently ongoing. I think that the concern is that there is a perception that the government just simply uh, takes over private enterprises where, or intervenes in private enterprises without any control. The company has a large amount of unpaid taxes. The plant in Panjing City is a focus of the regime's crackdown on private oil refiners. As well as tax violations, authorities have also deemed that it is non-compliant with environmental rules. It's not about being against regulation or uh, environmental rules. Absolutely no problem whatsoever with that. The problem is using those as a... Uh, sort of subterfuge to uh, intervene independent companies. The Bora refiner is one of the largest in China. It can process more than 20 million tonnes a year. Previously, the sector had been loosely regulated and companies exploited a tax loophole to boost profit results. Bloomberg reported the sources close to the matter, asking not to be named, said the company will be under government control from this month. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. NTD's classical Chinese dance competition approaches, and we sat down with one candidate, Marilyn Yang, to understand more of her artistic journey and what she has in store for us this year. A lot of times people ask us, oh, what's, what do you do? And we're like, oh, we're dancers. And they're like, oh, what do you do, ballet or like modern dance? And we're like, oh, no, we do classical Chinese dance. And then they're like, oh, what is that? Marilyn Yang is from classical Chinese dance company Shen Yun. A former gold medal holder, this is her third time joining the competition. I've been very familiar with classical Chinese culture because my mom was a singer in Shen Yun and both my brothers are dancers in Shen Yun Performing Arts. So it was kind of like a natural thing for me to follow in their footsteps, literally. When I was very small, I would look up to the dancers and be like, I want to be up there one day. As a kid, what really enchants you about Shen Yun was the colors, the costumes, and it was always about kind of the excitement of dancing on stage in front of an audience. But then once you actually start professionally, there are a lot of insights that you see afterwards, which is one thing, dance is not 
It's not easy. She is particularly impressed with one dance training she received at Shenyun, Shen Dai Shou, or the body leads the hands, and Kua Dai Tui, or the hips lead the legs. It really makes your moves very clean and big, and the way you can express yourself through your dance is a lot more powerful. In this technique, the core of the body, the source of all emotions, powers all of the movements. For example, if someone were to express like shy, shyness, um, instead of just using your arms, for example, to pose like a pose that's like shy or like you're blocking your face or that, it's like your body is moving first, like happy, like you might move here first, like excitement it always comes from this one point. Also, Shen Dai Shou Kua Dai makes our techniques better too. Your spins will be a lot faster, you'll spin a lot more. And then when you use Shen Dai Shou Kua Dai for jumping and like tumbling, it's very different for a dancer. They will immediately jump higher and feel like more lofty when they do it. Choreograph for this year's competition shows the story of Wang Zhaojun, one of the four most beautiful women in ancient China. Wang prevented bloodshed in her country by being a peace bride, married off to a remote and barren land that's close to today's Mongolia. But instead of focusing on the teary departure scene, Yang turned to the beauty's life on the barren land. For me, I incorporated some Mongolian dance moves. I wanted to show that her heart was open. She accepts her fate and she's not bitter about it and that it's already become a part of her. Like this culture, this Mongolian culture is part of who she is now. And then, but she sees a flower and then that brings back like the memories come flooding back to her and it shows that she still has that Han Dynasty maiden in her bones. I don't want people to believe that Wang Zhaojun, her whole life was sorrowful, that it was bitter. I want to show that how she was very generous. She won't drown in her own sorrows, that she'll keep looking forward and then that she'll continue her life in the best way possible. Yang said classical Chinese dance is able to embody 5,000 years of traditional morality and virtues into its essence, and it requires certain traits from the dancers. What really stands out is the selflessness. Like when we're dancing on stage, for example, it's not as dancers, usually people nowadays think it's about the spotlight. They want to be in the front row. They want to be the lead dancer. But for us, it's not about that. We want to give the audience, bring them on a spiritual level. I feel like classical Chinese dance gave meaning to my life because I'm doing something that's bigger than myself. That's to revive traditional Chinese culture. Through classical Chinese dance, I got to understand what China's heritage really is supposed to be like. It's divine. Now she gets to bring these traditions back to life through this expressive art form. Dance itself is a universal language. Like, you don't have to be of the same culture to understand Chinese dance. You can't really use words to describe China's history, China's dance, Chinese, Chinese art. It's something you should definitely come and experience for yourself. The competition will be held on September 2nd through the 5th. If you enjoy dance or ancient Chinese stories or wisdom, you can get your ticket at dance.ntdtv.com. You can also watch our live stream of the competition at ntd.com. And that's all for today, but before you go, we have a short announcement. We have our premiere at 9.30 p.m. from Monday to Saturday on TV and our YouTube channel. NTD is available on many platforms, including cable TV, satellite, and over-the-air TV across the U.S., and it continues to grow. Please check out ntd.com TV. Type in your zip code to find all the ways you can watch our show. Thanks for watching. See you next time.